deliver. I think my pen's over here. So here's your liver. It's the largest internal organ in the body. It is the only organ in the body that has the ability to regenerate. It can actually regrow. And cancer cannot get a hold on the body if your liver is working in peak performance. So that makes it pretty important. The liver, in fact, I've got a chapter in my book on the liver. I call it the project manager. And the reason why I call it the project manager is because everything that comes into the body goes first to the liver. And the liver determines what happens to that, whether it be food, whether it be chemical. Now, we are exposed to a lot of environmental poisons today. And when the environmental poisons come into the body, they go first to the liver. And the liver assesses it. And sometimes it'll break it down to substances that aren't so toxic and can be eliminated. And sometimes it looks at it and says, this is too toxic. And it wraps it up in fat and stores it. But what I want to look at, first of all tonight, is what your liver does with the food that you eat. And never in the history of mankind have we eaten so many carbohydrates. I want to do a carbohydrate assessment. And then we'll have a look at what your liver does with this. So most people in America in Australia, I've travelled all over Europe, breakfast is usually cereal or it could be toast. Would you agree, agree with me? <laughs> it's quick. It's just there. People can just get up and eat. And some other fast carbohydrate foods, we'll say cakes, uh, you call them cookies in Australia, we call them biscuits. I think your biscuits are like a roll or scone or something. Pasta. Pizza. <laughs> I have just been in Italy and the night before I flew out we went right into one of the cities and had pizza. And did you know that in Italy it's paper thin. It's incredibly thin. It had tomato sauce on it and then all these greens on the top. They did a plant <laughs> for a plant base. It's very nice. Also rice is another carbohydrate, potatoes. And last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallized acid that's been extracted from the sugarcane plant. All of these things break down in the gastrointestinal tract, and we're going to look at that process tomorrow, to glucose. Now the glucose, as a singular structure, can now be absorbed into the blood, and it goes on the M1 main highway straight to the project manager. And the project manager and sends it to the CBD. Remember the CBD, Central Business District of the Human Body, the inside workings of the cell. So the glu glucose goes in under the action of insulin and it goes through a 20-step pathway. And that 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. We're going to be looking at this process a few times this week, so you'll get used to it. So the chemical form of glucose that comes out of the 20-step pathway goes into an 8-step pathway. This 8-step pathway is called the powerhouse of the cell. It's called the powerhouse of the cell because of its ability to deliver 36 units of energy. What makes the difference? It's oxygen. This pathway, no oxygen. So the first place that the liver will send the glucose is through the 
through the pathways to produce energy. Number one goes to the cell. Now we've still got a lot of glucose left over and so now the liver will cause it to be stored like a little bunch of grapes. And these are little molecules of glucose. And they're called glycogen. We're going to be looking at diabetes later in the week and we're going to be seeing how important those little gly glycogen stores are. But on a high carbohydrate diet, we've still got a lot of glucose left over. And so now the liver causes it to be stored in the most amazing fuel deposit in the human body, fat cells. So this is the third place all the excess gets sent is to the fat cells. My daughter in Wisconsin, having seven children, she's got lots of stores in her basement. In her kitchen cupboards, she's got jars of food. And if they run out, she sends the children down to the basement to get the stores. That, that's, that's basically how the body works. <coughs> so as you'll see, as we go through other lectures, I'll be showing you how you can turn this around with exercise. So when you exercise in the morning, let's say, for instance, myself. Yesterday, I was very hungry when I arrived at the house I was staying with. It was 2.30 and I was very glad that they were about to have lunch. So I had a nice hearty lunch and I had such a hearty lunch I didn't need to eat again. So when I woke up this morning, I had water and then I went for my morning run. Where did I get the energy? It was my glycogen stores, quick release glucose stores, just sitting in the muscle cell particularly, waiting to be called on. And when I start moving the body, it plucks it, goes through the pathway. And if I ran out of them, well, We've got more stores there. It's an amazing process. But what I wanted to show you is it's the liver that determines where everything goes. And I also wanted to show you that fat doesn't make you fat. What makes you fat? It's this high, it's this high carbohydrate diet. And there's a very famous doctor, some people might say infamous, Dr. Robert Atkins, he made this theory famous. You see, he was a GP, putting on weight, knew his science, so he put a, did an experiment on himself. He decided to stop all carbohydrates. What did he eat? Most people don't realise, three cups of vegetables a day, so there's the fibre. He ate a lot of meat, butter, cream, cheese, eggs, so there's a lot of protein there and fat and the weight just fell off him. And you can see why, because he's not giving the quick release glucose food. His liver can convert stored fat back to glucose. That's why he was losing weight. And his liver can convert protein and fat to glucose if it needs it. So this breaking down of the stored fat to give glucose is called gluconeogenesis, creating glucose out of the fat stores. So his theory worked. He was never hungry because as you'll see tomorrow night, these, these three foods keep the food in the stomach longer. So as he found the perfect diet, the weight's just falling off him, never hungry, lots of energy, put some of his patients on it. They loved it. They could eat everything they don't usually eat on a diet. You see, his book was number one on the New York Times best-selling list four years running. So that demands a little look. I would never look at it because I thought I'm not interested in Atkins diet. It's meat, butter, cream, cheese, eggs. I'm a plant-based person. But I had a guest and they said, you're not going to like this, but I go really well on the Atkins diet. Now I've got to listen. That's this man's story. I wanted to know why he went so well on the Atkins diet. I was intrigued. 
So to cut a long story short, I eventually got the book and it was a fascinating read, fascinating, because his science was correct. After a year, his cancer patients are going into remission. Cancer cells consume 15 times the glucose of any other cell. You see, this is a very fast pathway. Consumes a lot of glucose, no oxygen. That's where cancer cells run. It's their favorite place to run. So when, when the high glucose foods are stopped, as Dr. Holland said in the book, The Germ That Causes Cancer, he says, when you deprive cancer cells of glucose, they self-destruct. Doesn't every cell use glucose? Yes, they do, but this is a slower pathway. It can wait for the glucose <laughs> from the fiber. It can wait to get some glucose from these things. His cancer patients were going into remission. His diabetics were coming off their medication. Well, that's not hard to work out. <laughs> Low carbohydrate, nice slow release of glucose. Pancreases were getting a break. So he went into the medical books to see if there was any research done on this. And he discovered that these are the three essential food groups. Essential means you've got to put it in, the body doesn't make it. Why are they essential? Fiber is essential because our colon needs to be swept every day, you'll see that tomorrow night. And fiber sweeps it and it's in the fiber part of food you often get a concentration of nutrients. The highest nutrient content in the potato is just under the skin. So you peel the potato, you lose a lot of the nutrients. Protein is essential. Why is protein essential? As we just saw, the crosswood bands in the DNA, they're made up of amino acids. You cannot build the body without protein. You cannot heal without protein. And 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is protein makes it pretty important. Fat is an essential nutrient. This fat-free diet that's been <coughs> popular since the 80s, it's actually an unscientific diet, makes no sense at all. There are fats that heal and there are fats that kill and we're going to be defining that later in the week. The killer fats are the altered fats. No, fat's essential. You see, 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is fat, except for the brain cell. It's 70% fat. In fact, the brain is the fattiest organ in the body. No, fat is an essential nutrient. What Atkins also discovered is that the non-essential food group is carbohydrates. Now let me very quickly say, carbohydrates aren't bad. They're not bad, but they're a non-essential. You know what that means, you can live without them. But I'm not suggesting you do. What a relief, we like it. <laughs> the only time carbohydrates pose a problem is if they're overdone and refined. And I think you'll agree with me on this high carbohydrate diet most are overdoing and refining the carbohydrates. So if you were looking at a food that you'd back off, wouldn't you back off the non-essential? And I don't think anyone ever chose to eat like this. It's just there, it's just quick, it's just fast. Isn't that true? So when people come to our retreats, I say, get your cupboards well stocked. So that when you do come home hungry, you've got something there that you can cook that's not just bread and cereal and cakes. <laughs> so because the carbohydrates are the non-essential, that's your negotiating part of the meal. And the negotiations change depending on your height, depending on your size, depending on your weight, depending on your genes, depending on your health status. 
I have three sons, and one son inherited his father's body type, which is muscle, big. The other two sons inherited their mother's body type, which is little hard to put on weight, and that's no fun for a boy who wants to be big and muscly. So my son James, and you can see the pictures of my kids in the back of my book, he's the one that's standing like this. He's, he's big. I was showing a guy in New York a picture of James, and he goes, he's big. <laughs> How did he do that? Well, he increased the protein, in fact, I went into his bedroom one day and I knocked my foot on this big bucket. I said, what's that? I said, it's my protein powder, Mum. My protein powder. <laughs> and he worked out at the gym. He worked and he worked and he got big. In fact, he's big. He's got this following of young guys who want to look like him now. <laughs> but you will find bodybuilders, what do they take? They take the protein because the protein builds the muscle. So your carbs are your negotiating. And my son said to me, you know, bodybuilding.com, it says you want to put on muscle, you don't carb load, you go here. And athletes used to carb load, but they don't do that anymore because you know what the carbs do? Oh, they'll get you up, but then you get the dump. Whereas these three foods, and we'll see this when we look at diabetes, they give a consistent, sure delivery of fuel. So if someone wanted to conquer cancer and conquer it well and quickly, what would they drastically drop? The carbs. If someone wanted to conquer their diabetes, what would they drastically drop? The carbs. Yeah. But how do you do it on a plant-based diet? Let me show you. We're going to go to Genesis 129 where God's telling Adam and Eve what to eat. We're going to look at the food. We're going to have a look at the protein content and the carbohydrate content. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed. What's a herb-bearing seed? A herb-bearing seed is a grain. A herb-bearing seed is a legume. A herb-bearing seed is a seed. So with grain, we have got so many. Wheat, rye, barley, oats, amaranth, buckwheat, quinoa, millet. High, grains are high in protein and high in carbohydrate. How many on our carbohydrate list are from grain? So we've got grain, 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 the majority. And legume, there's your beans. So chickpeas, lima beans, black-eyed beans, turtle beans, lentils, so many beans. Beans are high in protein, but they are medium to low in carbohydrate. The fact is they are about a third the carbohydrate content that you will find in your grain. So looking at lowering your carbohydrate content, the legumes are a good choice. You just got to make sure you soak them overnight and rinse them very, very well and bring them to the boil and rinse them again. You know, you bring them to boil and see all that fluff? That's wind. You've got to get it out. <laughs> seed. So you've got pumpkin seed, sesame seed, sunflower seed, chia, flax seed or linseed. They're high in protein and quite low in carbohydrate. God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree. And the which of the trees are fruit bearing seed? So, what's a fruit bearing seed? There's your nut. Your nut comes from the fruit of the tree. So, pumpkins, so we've done, we've done our seeds. So, with your nuts, you've got cashews, almonds, Brazils, hazelnuts, Brazil nuts, pecan, you call them pecan, walnuts. They're high in protein and quite low in carbohydrate. And so to ensure you're getting your three essentials, my suggestion is to increase the legume nut seed part of your meal and to decrease the, uh, the grain part of your meal. 
So as you can see, the carbohydrates aren't bad, it's only when they're overdone. And depending on what your health situation is as to how you'll juggle that, my husband would never forgive me if the potatoes stopped. He's an Irishman, we have to have potatoes every day. Now he has about five times the potatoes I have. So that, your carbs are your negotiators. So that's how you can do it on a vegetarian diet, a plant-based diet. What's interesting is the last part of that, or the last phrase of the verse Genesis 129, God said, the seed to you it shall be for meat. In other words, the main substance of your food. And why is that? Because your seed is an excellent source of your three essentials, fiber, proteins, and fats. Now, the reason Dr. Atkins had to give his patients three cups of vegetables a day because if they just had meat, butter, cream, cheese, eggs, they'd all be developing colon cancer by the end of a couple of years because your colon must have fibre. And so there's the story with what the liver does with the food that we eat. At our retreat, and there's a retreat in Alabama that we that regularly run our program, it's called Living Springs. So the first two days, the guests are fasting. So I want to show you what happens when our guests fast. When our guests fast, we're just giving them juices. Usually 80% carrot, 10% apple, 10% silver. It's called the vegetarian's milk. It's a nice balance. They have five juices a day, so they have a juice at eight, 10, 12, two, and four. So five juices a day. Sometimes we add a, some cucumber and greens, sometimes we'll add ginger, sometimes some beets, but that's basically the juices in the day. So we're not giving them enough glucose to run on, so some of their fat cells are getting broken down to give the glucose that they need. But as those fat cells get broken down, something a bit more sinister is released. Do you remember I said when environmental poisons come into the body and they're quite toxic, the liver will wrap them up in fat and store them? And so the person now is at the retreat. We're not giving them enough glucose to run on and so the fat stores get broken down. And something else is released. It's the fat soluble toxin. That's why a, uh, it's often called a fast or a cleanse when a person does a couple of days of juices because their fat cells are getting broken down releasing these stored environmental poisons. Once again it's in the bloodstream. Once again it comes to the liver. Once again, the liver says, not this nasty guy again. And the liver's about to say, wrap him up in fat and store him. And then the liver says, oh, hang on, they're at the retreat. We're getting enough nutrients to break that down to a water-soluble state. Because the body can only release that fat-soluble toxin in a water-soluble state. And the liver breaks it down to a water-soluble state in three phases. So phase one happens when the person, basically happens when they miss their first meal. So in phase one, the liver takes the fat soluble toxin and breaks it down to a metabolite. A metabolite simply means the first stage of metabolism or the first stage of breakdown. Now this metabolite can sometimes be a hundred times more toxic than it originally was. This metabolite is highly volatile. This metabolite creates a lot of free radicals and free radicals damage the tissues. And you might say, well, what's the liver doing? It's just created something worse than it originally was. It's a process. It's like when you clean out the kitchen cupboards, the kitchen looks a hundred times messier than when you started. 
It's a process. When I'm weeding the garden, which I'm sure I'll be busy doing when I get home, it's going to look worse than when I started. It's a process. And the liver has certain needs in phase one to cope with this. It needs antioxidants. Antioxidants are called free radical scavengers. So your most potent antioxidants are beta carotene. And beta carotene is found in all your green and orange red vegetables. So remember the juice I explained, carrot, sorry, and apple, 80% carrot, 10%, sorry, 10% apple, very high in beta carotenes. Also vitamin C and vitamin E. Vitamin E is a fat-soluble vitamin. So these are the most potent antioxidants. So we give our guests vitamin C three times a day. Vitamin C is not ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is only part of vitamin C. So when you buy vitamin C, make sure it's ascorbic acid with bioflavonoids. <coughs> That's what's found in your vegetables and fruits. Also, at this stage, minerals are needed and also vitamin B. And our guests are getting lots of minerals in their juices. Also, vitamin B we give with vitamin C. We nutritionally support the liver to effectively detoxify from fat soluble toxins. Within 36 hours of beginning a fast program, phase two kicks in. So in phase two, the liver takes this highly volatile, toxic metabolite and joins it together with amino acids. So what we do, we give our guests every second juice, they get a protein drink. On Monday, the first day of the detox, they get a protein drink at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. But on Tuesday morning, when their liver goes into the second stage of detox, they get three protein drinks, as well as their juice. So the juices are supplying all this and then the protein drinks are supplying the amino acids. So when stage two happens, within 36 hours of starting the detox, the liver takes this toxic metabolite and it joins it together with amino acids. So the union of that toxic metabolite and the amino acids gives us the water-soluble state. Phase three happens in conjunction with phase two. In phase three, the liver takes the water-soluble state and it releases it out via the sweat glands, releases it out via the urine, releases them out via the colon. This process has only been known since 2002. And this process shows why today you are far better to do two days juices only. It also shows why no water fast. Because if you do a water fast, you're not supplying the nutrients that your liver needs to effectively break down the fat-soluble toxin to a water-soluble state. So in phase two, your liver needs protein. And it gets the protein from protein drinks. So the protein drinks we use is pea protein. You can get some quite nice hemp proteins, brown rice proteins. You can get some nice plant-based protein powders now. 
You just got to check the label that they haven't got sugar in them. And we usually mix it with either almond milk or organic soy milk and a little bit of coconut. Coconut milk makes it tasty, but it also is supplying your vitamin E, your fat-soluble vitamin. So 50 years ago, people could do water fast because they weren't dealing with the fat-soluble toxins that we are dealing with today. It's impossible, inevitable, <laughs> that we are exposed to environmental poisons. But I'm very thankful to God that he's given us a liver that when given the right conditions, it can effectively detoxify us. It can effectively break the fat-soluble toxins down to a water-soluble state. So we encourage with our guests to drink adequate water because when you drink adequate water, your body has enough water to throw the waste off via the skin. And at our retreats, we always have steam saunas, which really encourages the, the sweating process. We encourage adequate water so that the urine is nice and clear and the water soluble can be urinated out. We also encourage, and we'll look at this tomorrow night, um, the colon to be evacuating ideally twice a day. Because it's one thing to detoxify from the fat soluble toxins and have them released. It's another thing to be able to break it down to a water soluble state. But it's another thing to be able to eliminate it out of the body. I was giving this presentation a few years ago and a man said to me, this is very interesting, but he said, it's not for your lay people, this is for your academics. I said, lay people have livers too. <laughs> when I did my nutrition course, I think we studied it every module. But it's important information for us living today who are exposed to so many environmental poisons. And it also shows why the three essential food groups are essential. Your highest fibre foods are your vegetables. And your vegetables are high in minerals, high in beta carotenes. It also shows why the protein is so important. Because the protein is required to mop up those toxic metabolites. It also shows the importance of fat because phase three requires fat. In what way? You see, what fat does is it keeps the membrane around every cell in the body supple. And when the membrane around every cell in the body is supple, it's able to do its work. See, this phase three is called the anti-porter system. And the antiporter system is when the water soluble state is dropped into the blood and then the liver's looking for any more fat, so to fat soluble to toxins so it'll drop the water soluble and pick up the fat soluble and then put it through the three phase of the liver detox. So antiporter means drop one and pick up another. The most popular way of eating today is time-restricted eating. I don't know if you've heard of time-restricted eating. Time-restricted eating is eating two meals six hours apart in a 24-hour period. You've heard of the uh, intermittent fasting, 5-2 diet. They're popular ways. Well, it's time-restricted eating. And what they suggest is eating a meal at one and then another meal at seven. But a few people have said to me, by 10 o'clock I'm fading. <laughs> and if I eat a large meal at seven, I can't sleep at night. And so what we do at our retreats, we serve a meal at 7.30, 
and then we serve a meal about 1.30 or 2, and then not another meal until breakfast the next day. So our guests all have a steam sauna every day, so that stimulates the skin, the sweat glands to throw off the waste. But when you're throwing off the waste, you're also losing some minerals. So we serve broth at 6 p.m. at night. Remember I said the juices come at 8, 10, 12, 2 and 4? And then at 6 p.m. we serve broth, which is a lot of vegetables cooked in a lot of water for about four hours. We even put the celery leaves, potatoes, onions, carrots, whole onions, whole garlic knobs in, and stinging nettle. Stinging nettle is very high in minerals. After four hours, we strain all that, and they drink the water. So it's a very mineral-rich broth. And we also put Celtic salt. Celtic salt has 82 minerals in it. So when you, when you uh, are eating the time-restricted eating, you're allowing your body to have an 18-hour fast, which is what I did yesterday. I had breakfast at 8 o'clock at my daughter's house in Wisconsin, and then I didn't eat again till 2 o'clock here, which would have been 4 o'clock with Wisconsin time, and then I did not eat again till breakfast the next day. Now, because I'm lecturing at night, I'm having a light tea. You call it supper. <laughs> but you'll notice that we serve a quite a light one, and we also serve it because we realise a lot of people are working and, and need something to eat when they get home. But when this eating program is implemented, it allows an 18-hour fast every 24 hours which allows your liver that time to have a little bit of a detox. Breakfast means break fast. But it's hard to break the fast when someone's eaten a huge meal at 8 or 9 o'clock at night. The, the poor stomach has to keep working even though every, every Thing else in the body is sleeping, the stomach cannot sleep when it's full of food because that food would rot in that warm environment. So depending on you, your lifestyle, what you're able to do, what you're better to adhere to is eating breakfast like a king. It's the old saying, lunch like a queen and tea, or you call it supper like a pauper. One lady said to me, what do paupers eat? I said, sometimes nothing. <laughs> and I'm interested to see that science today is pushing this time-restricted eating, which means you give, you give your stomach breaks. And tomorrow, when we look at our journey through the gastrointestinal tract, where I show you what happens at every different stage through your gastrointestinal tract, which is about eight yards long. It's a long it's a long journey, but we'll be able to cover that journey in about 50 minutes, so it'll be all right. You will see that as we go through the lectures, every lecture basically builds on the previous one, so we get a, a whole picture of the body and how it works. But I find this three phase of the liver detox fascinating. As I mentioned before, I've got a chapter in my book called The Liver, the Project Manager, which which again explains the three phase of the liver detox. Now we've got a few minutes to answer some questions, if anyone has a question. Yes? How long do we do the juice How long do we do the juice fast for? Uh, two days. Um, that's a good question, how often? Now if we have guests come to us for two weeks, they do two days juicing, and then they eat the rest of the week, then they do another two days juicing. So it's far better, considering the three phase of the liver detox, to do two days a week rather than a whole week fast. Because if you do a whole week fast, too many fat-soluble toxins can be released, especially if you're not providing the nutrients, the person can actually be sicker than when they started. So how often would you do it? 
I basically leave it up to the person. We had a 220 kilo man come. That would be f about 440 pound. He's a very large man. In fact, he said he wouldn't use our, our exercise equipment because he'd probably break it all. But he went four days juices. But what we did was we made sure we gave him three protein drinks every day. But if we have someone who's had major exposure to chemicals, then it's best that they only do the two days because too, too many are released all at once. You're better to eat at the environmental poison load in the body, little by little by little. Uh, no, we usually do a little bit of a variety. So sometimes we add ginger, sometimes we do um, cucumber and apple and lots of greens. Sometimes we'll put carrot, sorry, and apple and some beetroot. So there's slight variations on the juices. Uh, eight ounce. Yes? the starch solution. Yeah. I'm familiar with Dr. McDougall's yeah, work. Yeah, so he talks all about the importance of having a high carb, yeah. low fat diet. Yeah. Um, but this is different. It's actually not that different okay. because his carb are all whole grains and he also includes legumes and I don't advocate high fat, and Atkins didn't advocate high fat either, so it's fairly similar. Well, that's very good that, that all the questions have been answered. <laughs> oh, there's one more here. Yeah. What are some suggestions okay. for breakfast? Okay, yep, that's a good idea, and we'll be covering it as we go through the week. So um, what you can do to get the, to lower the carbohydrate is have, make sure you have whole grains, so it might be millet or buckwheat or, uh, or oatmeal. Um, and then with that, you can have some fruit, so there's your... Um, there's your fiber and your coconut milk or almond milk or organic soy milk. And then you can put chia seed and ground flax on that and have maybe eight to 10 almonds. So your seeds and your nuts can get your protein up a little bit and your fats up a bit. Okay. And you also talked about the intestinal tract, the villi. Um, I've read and heard a lot about mu mucoid plaque that inhibits the villi from doing its job. So what, what inhibits it? Um, mucoid plaque. Yeah. Yeah, a mucoid plaque. How do you get yeah. rid of it? Uh, you'll find out tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> um, if one's <coughs> Once you start stopping the foods that contribute to the mucoid plaque. One of the worst is cheese. Cheese is a very indigestible substance. Mm -hmm. So once you start having a, a higher fiber diet, uh, cutting out all the refines, that it, it automatically does clean. Okay, all right. So I might hand it over now to, oh, have, was there one more question or? No. Oh, one more. We'll do this. We'll make this the last. How do you keep the balance of protein um, at a level where you're not going to get kidney toxicity if you're overdoing the protein? Um, the only protein that will give kidney toxicity is animal protein. And Dr. Colin Campbell in his book, um, China Study. Yes, I, I know about he that. He showed very clearly that it's the animal protein that's the problem. He did a lot of experiment with the rats, 20% uh, vegetable protein, no problem. With uh, 
animal protein, 56 or 58 percent is burnt as fuel. That's a 42 percent waste. That's a huge load on the kidneys. Whereas plant protein does not do that. So if you're on a vegan diet, then you don't have to worry about that. If you're on a plant based, no. See, I have um, a low carbohydrate diet and I have high fiber, generous protein and, and the good fats. My favorite's probably olive oil, but I don't drink half a cup of olive oil a day. I have a little bit of olive oil because it's a very concentrated food. But mostly I eat legumes twice a day. I eat legumes at breakfast, I eat legumes at lunch. Um, and a lot of people think, isn't that too much protein? Not at all, because plant protein is totally different to the animal protein. But we're also jumping the gun a bit here because we're going to be cover these things in detail through the week. But I'm very happy to answer your questions. So I might hand it over to to our our um, Lyle, our friend here, Lyle. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is great. I'm excited about this. How about you? <laughs> Thank you, Barbara, for okay. presenting these lessons in such an understandable way. That's good. Tomorrow night, as Barbara said, we're gonna, she's going to be covering the whole idea of uh, the lesson on the gut, the health of the gut. So that's a pretty important part. So we look forward to having you back tomorrow evening. Let's go ahead and bow our heads as a, and thank the Lord for our meeting tonight. Thank you, Father for creating our bodies such incredible machines. And you provided everything we need. Yeah, where we are. We're grateful and we are wanting to go home and rest tonight and come back again tomorrow. Bless us as we rest. Uh, let us rest our minds as well to be able to absorb even more. Thank you again in Jesus' name, amen.